phone. I invite you to follow along. Uh, I'm going to just jump in and I'll read the text for us. Luke chapter 2, verse 10. It says, But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. And, and, and verse 11 as well. Today in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. Uh, you might have noticed when Ashley was up here, uh, we're expecting our first child in January. Thank you. Um, for months now, we've been in this time of waiting. Uh, we've known for a little bit, right, that this child is coming. Um, we're planning, preparing, prepare, you know, praying. Um, but it's just a season of waiting uh, and a season of excitement for this child to come. Now, there's a lot of unknowns, too. Like, we can't really prepare that much because we just don't know how we're going to feel. Or we don't know what the baby's really going to be like or how he'll sleep or how we'll sleep. We're already not sleeping, and so just pray for us, right? But there's anticipation. We know this kid's coming. And this anticipation that we have is just a small glimmer of the longing that I would say all people have for Christ to come. It's at this time of year that we talk about the season of Advent. You might not be familiar with that word. Advent comes from a Latin word meaning coming or arrival. It's pointing us to the coming or arrival of Christ. It, it's a season of longing and waiting. There's really a healthy tension when it comes to Advent and anticipating Jesus' coming. It's in Advent that we remember the longing that the world had the first time for Jesus to come. The deep waiting that God's people had for the promised Messiah. And we recognize this as Jesus' birth. He came the first time. But now we're waiting and longing for Jesus to come again. Our passage today shows us that in one sense the wait's over. But as you and I experience the world around us, we know that in another sense, there's more waiting. For thousands of years, God's people had been waiting, and God said, I'm going to send a Messiah. There's going to be a Savior. And just like God's people throughout all of time, for us, it's hard to wait. Not only that, in this time of year, we see all of these things inviting us to like Christmas cheer and joy and happiness and pretty lights and be sentimental. But in the background of our lives, we still have pain and brokenness. And, you know, joy being on a mug doesn't really help me to have joy right now. So some of the questions that you and I need to answer today are, one, how does the coming of Jesus give me joy right now? And two, how does Jesus coming again give me hope for joy for eternity? Because great joy comes knowing that Jesus came once and he's coming again. When he comes again, everything will change. He's going to put away sin and death and brokenness, everything that's wrong with the world will be destroyed. Every wrong thing, he'll make new. This is the main point of today. If you hear nothing else, just hear this, and maybe you could tune out. Please don't, but here's the main point for today. True joy is found in Jesus Christ. And I want us to see two things within this. Number one, Joy from Christ relieves all our fears. And secondly, those that believe in Christ will have joy now and forever. So our first point, joy from Christ relieves our fears. You know, in this passage, the angel of the Lord comes to these shepherds. These shepherds are on the hillside of Bethlehem, they're watching over their flock at night. And these guys, they've, they've got a simple job, but it's not easy. 
It's mundane, really, too. Uh, they're kind of the lower class position of society, but they've got a job that's absolutely necessary. They stay awake at night, waiting, protecting the flock. They're looking out for wolves. They're out in the cold. They're out in the heat. And they're doing this over and over again in the same places. These shepherds would have known about this promise of a Messiah. In Jewish culture, they would have grown up hearing the story. A story that for the Jewish people would have been all of their hope. God has a rescue plan. The God who created all things on heaven and earth has made promises to send this Savior. But when's he's gonna, when is he going to come? I'm working day to day. I'm weary. When is this Savior who would take shame and fear and bring forgiveness and peace and joy, when is he going to come? On what we would expect is probably just an ordinary night for these shepherds. Out of the darkness, this angel comes and the glory of the Lord is shining around them. Now, verse 9 tells us that these guys are terrified. They're struck with fear in God's presence and with this angel. I think we should pause for a moment and ask, why do we have fear? What makes us afraid? I think it's important for us to see that there's really two concepts of fear. They're related, but they're distinct. One reason we fear, which we're all familiar with, is when something threatens us. There's something I expect that has the potential to harm me. Uh, it might potentially harm me physically or emotionally. It might be harming me uh, with my finances. It might be harming me via harming someone I care about. That's one type of fear. Something's a threat to me. Then there's another type of fear, which is more positive. And this is when we have awe, wonder, respect, reverence for something. Those who have reverence for God are often called those who fear God because when faced with his majesty and glory and his holiness, he demands reverence and respect. Uh, my wife and I used to explain it this way to uh, middle school girls. We, we would say, imagine Beyonce and Jimmy Fallon just show up in your house when you're in your living room. Well, you're not afraid because Beyonce and Jimmy Fallon are going to hurt you. You're afraid because you're like, wow, uh, these people of high position that I respect, they're here, so I'm, I'm, I have fear. The shepherds, they look back at what they, that this angel and are afraid. But the angel says, don't be afraid. Look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. There's a reason you don't have to be afraid. There's good news. There's great joy to be had. Uh, this angel, he's definitely speaking towards their immediate fear, right? I mean, they're fearing the glory of the Lord shining, and this angel, they probably think they're going to die. But he's also bringing them perspective, information that will help them go beyond the strangeness and the fear of that single moment giving them news that goes beyond their mundane lives. And in a sense, he's saying, fear doesn't need to be your current state. You can have a whole new state of being. There's deep joy to be had. And here's how I'm defining joy today. A state of deep gladness due to inner realities of your heart. Where happiness has to deal with emotions and external circumstances that are affecting me, joy has to deal with the inner reality that I know to be true. So you and I, we need to zoom out. The fears we have, there's a lot of them. Some of them are misplaced and keep us from joy in Christ. Uh, some of the fears we have are good, right? 
physical danger, driving too fast, it's going to keep me alive. But also, we need a picture of the healthy fear of God, a picture of why this good news brings joy. Here's the thing. You and I are not equal with God. In our sin, we take the stance of rebellion towards Him. Uh, Part of the reason we long for things to be different and made right in the world is because sin is a reality. In our sin, we try to put ourselves in God's place. Though He is King and Creator over all things, we try to make ourselves into little kings and queens of our lives. God, perfectly holy, perfectly just, can't overlook sin. I think this is going to be really difficult to grasp. The reality is, we all want a holy God who is perfectly loving and in his perfect justice will make all things right. But, as Paul says in Romans 5, we start off as enemies of that God. But the angel says, don't be afraid. I'm no threat to you. God's no threat to you. There's actually something incredible that we need to know. Look, the angel says. Some translations say, behold. Let's make this clear. There's good news. Great joy in Jesus will relieve your fear. The birth of Jesus is the end of your fear. What are you afraid of today? What thing in your fear are you trying to control? What are the things that worry you, that wake you up in the middle of the night? Maybe you're afraid of being alone. You have a secret that you don't want anyone to know. Maybe your finances are fine, but you're trying to find more ways to feel good about them. Perhaps just the general uncertainty of the future is just consuming you. It's these things. Whatever wakes you up at night, Jesus says, behold, look, the good news will bring you great joy. In Matthew chapter 5, Jesus says, come to me, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take up my yoke and learn from me, because I am lowly and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. You know, probably, um, well, actually, I know exactly when it was. uh, Two summers ago, uh, I would have told you I feel the most free and sure of God's provision for Ashley and I than I ever had in my entire life. And then as soon as we found out we were pregnant, I started obsessing over retirement planning. I was so sure two years ago, God's provided for us. It's so clear. Cool, we're qu- I'm quitting my job. I'm joining reconciliation. He's going to provide all of our needs. There's an inner reality of God in me that I was acknowledging that was making me so safe and sure. And then as soon as an external circumstance changed, I found myself afraid. Real rest for our souls isn't found in external circumstances. It's found in Jesus Christ. True joy is found in Jesus because true life is found in Jesus. Yeah, I should plan and be responsible with my finances, but when I come to Jesus and I have a relationship with him, I don't have to try and relieve my burdens in my own strength. Here's our problem. Because we're such a self-sufficient society and we want to be our own little kings and queens of our lives, we try as created beings to be like the Creator. Our temptation is to live like we're in a different reality. In our independence and desire to be like God, we try to find joy in anything but God. We push the limits, and then we find ourselves burdened and weary and afraid. 
But God responds to those who sin against Him and says, listen, there's good news of great joy for all people. The God of the universe says, with me, I'll give you rest for your soul. Joy from Christ relieves our fears. I hope you're asking now, how do I find this joy? Right? We find this joy by believing in the good news. This leads us to our second point. Those that believe in Christ will have joy now and forever. Uh, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you that um, for several weeks, uh, I was ignoring a warning light on the dashboard of my car. Um, been driving the same car for several years, familiar with my car, gets regular maintenance. At first, the light was just flashing, then it turned off, so I ignored it. Then, most recently, the light stayed on every time the car was on. And uh, it had a pretty clear message. It said maintenance required. Basically like, hey, you need to do something, right? The car's, hey, do something. There's information it's given me. I need to do something about this. The light was telling me, go get the car checked out. Some of us hear about the good news of great joy with Christ, but never really check it out. Never really take this seriously, that we need to get some clarity on, well, what is this? What is this good news? To have this great joy in Christ, we've got to check this out. What is the angel actually saying? The good news is that the birth of Jesus is the end of our fear and the beginning of our joy. The solution to our sin problem is that in God's loving kindness, He moved toward us to save from sin. We had no capability of solving this. Though we were enemies of God, He sent His Son so that we could be reconciled to God through Christ. The good news the fulfilled promise of the Messiah. God continually reminded His people throughout the, the Old Testament that this Savior would come into the world. This news was found in the manger with the birth of a baby. Uh, hundreds of years before Jesus was born, uh, Isaiah said this in Isaiah uh, 9 verse 6, for a child will be born for us, a son will be given to us, and the government will be on his shoulders. He will be named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. The news of his arrival was news of deliverance. Jesus came to deliver from sin and shame and oppression. To deliver us from our fleeting attempts to find joy in the things of this world. In his love, he came near to us, died, taking with him all of our fears and sins so that we could have rest and joy. This is true, it's reliable. This news isn't like entertainment pretending to be news, right? like what's on TV and on our web browsers today. This isn't filler in the background to just let play and maybe we'll listen. Jesus seeks to save the lost, heal the sick, free the oppressed. Isn't that interesting? He came to seek those who know they're lost. You might be sitting here today thinking, well, is this news really for me? I would say the fact that the angel proclaims this news to shepherds, it shows us who the gospel's for. It's those that believe in Christ who will have joy everlasting. Shepherds were nomads on the outskirts of civilization. Not a glamorous role of taking care of sheep. God's not interested in what you could do for Him. 
He can't impress him. He's not bringing news to people who pretend to have it all together or know a lot of the Bible. As one of my friends puts it, God has never been on a talent search. He's not a spiritual recruiter. If so, he would have woken up the religious elite and you know, left the shepherds alone. Jesus didn't come to be with those who were a part of the in crowd. Uh, Jesus says in Mark 2, it's not those who are well who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. It's those who know they need saving that Jesus comes to. That's the whole point of a Savior, to save those who know that they need saving. Maybe you have longing in your heart. This news is for you. Advent is for all of us. Those who believe in Christ will have joy now and forever. You might be thinking to yourself, well, I don't have joy now. I I, I believe in Christ, but things are still wrong with the world. What do I do with that? That is the tension we're in. This is part of the reason why we celebrate Advent, to acknowledge the longing, the waiting. We can have faith in Christ today, but are still be in a time of longing. That's the tension we're holding on to. Uh, there's really two realities of the gospel. There's a now reality and a future reality. Uh, You might be familiar with this. Theologians refer to this as the already and the not yet. A now reality. If you're a follower of Christ and you've trusted in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're free. You're free from sin and shame, from needing to perform. Um, You're free from looking for your ultimate joy to be anything in this world. You're adopted. You're redeemed. That's the now reality. But that's not all. And and this is how we'll begin to close our our time out together. Uh, There's a future reality. Really here we're answering the question, if Jesus died for my sins, why do I still have such a deep longing in my heart? The future reality, Jesus is coming back. If you have faith in Christ, you are saved and you will be saved. Uh, Let's look at Revelation uh, chapter 19 together. This is the future reality of the gospel. Revelation 19 verses 6 through 9. It says, I heard something like a a voice of a vast multitude, like the sound of cascading waters and like the rumbling of loud thunder saying, Hallelujah, because our Lord God, the Almighty, reigns. Let us be glad, rejoice, and give Him glory, because the marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has prepared herself. She was given fine linen to wear, bright and pure, for the fine linen represents the righteous acts of the saints. Then He said to me, Write, Blessed are those invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. He also said to me, These words of God are true. I have this memory from about a decade ago that's just a vivid image that's stuck in my mind. Um, I I was at a wedding, and I was sitting in this, this large church. The wedding was starting, and one of my best friends was sitting a few rows ahead of me. His wife was a bridesmaid in the wedding. And as the wedding party started to enter, I was looking kind of around around at all the people who were, you know, uh, viewing the wedding. And I noticed my friend as his wife, the bridesmaid in this wedding, was walking down the aisle. 
And other people were just smiling, some people taking pictures with their phones. I don't know why people get phone, their phones out during a wedding, but um, I noticed my friend wasn't just smiling when his wife was coming down the aisle. Uh, he, he was almost getting up out of his seat and, and like standing up towards her. Uh, I can't even really des- describe the, just the intimacy and the look of his face. But I know that to him, it didn't matter that there was another bride that was about to come down the aisle. His bride was right there. And there was no one else in the room. In Revelation 19, we have a picture of how God wraps up his great story of redemption. The people worship. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God reigns. Hallelujah, because there's going to be a wedding. The marriage of the Lamb has come, and His bride has made herself ready. God's showing us that of all the way He he relates to His people, He wants the kind of a relationship found in a marriage. God doesn't want us to follow Him and check off a list of rules. He wants our hearts. He wants our hearts to be His. Now, I know that some of you have grown up with bad examples of marriages. Or marriage in general is a sore topic. There's pain points there. Don't let that get in the way of the beauty of this truth. Marriage is designed to be the most intimate and committed of all the ways we could relate to each other as humans. Absolute vulnerability. Hearts tied together. That's what makes a marriage an actual marriage. When one spouse is giving their heart to the other, but the other one has their heart in their job, that's not a marriage. When one spouse is giving their heart to the other, but the other is giving their heart to another person, it's not a marriage. Or a hobby, or whatever. This is what our hearts long for. Marriage with Christ. True joy found in Christ because the sacrificial lamb, Jesus, is the only one who could rescue us. We long for the joy of being the lamb's bride. I'm thankful that I know most of you here, and I, I'm guessing that most of you aren't just like, especially men, like, oh, I'm going to be Christ's bride. That's weird to me. If you are in, in that place, let's work on that together. If you're a follower of Christ, you're his bride. Jesus came to heal hearts. Those who sinned against him, those who who look to find joy in things that will leave us empty. He wants us captivated with Him. Just like any other marriage wouldn't make sense to say, I'm married, but I'm more intimate with my job, or I'm more intimate with another person, or I'm more intimate with the idea of future, or I'm more in love with my kids. Jesus Christ wants our hearts The thing you're most in love with is the thing you'll try to find joy in. Anything other than Christ will leave you longing for more. Our great joy is in the good news. Those that believe in Christ will have joy now and forever. As we close, I just want to ask you. You don't have to answer out loud. But do you have joy in Jesus Christ? Do you see how his life, death, and resurrection, his promise to come again, does that give you great joy now and forever? The last verse we read in in Revelation said, blessed are those invited to the marriage feast. These words of God are true. So 
This is a fact. True joy is found in Jesus. The gospel is the invitation to peace. I want to invite you for the rest of this season, for the rest of your life, maybe today for the first time even, find true joy in Jesus. Let's pray. Come, thou long expected Jesus. God, the hymn says, You were born to set your people free and to release us from our fears and sins. Lord, I pray that um, as we know that you're the true desire of every nation and the longing of every heart, um, God, I pray that for the hearts represented here in this room, that Jesus Christ would be the joy of every heart. God, true joy is found in your Son, Jesus Christ. I pray that our hearts would be set on finding this joy in Him, acknowledging that there's no heart hope apart from you. God, we need you and we love you. Amen.